And I got my YouTube connected. Hello, YouTube friends. Sorry about that delay. All right. And closed captioning is available tonight. Also, if you need it in a different language, that's so exciting. We just discovered that just before this event. So if you click on the CC button, the little Chevron arrow, you can choose a language if you prefer a different language. It's exciting. So welcome to tonight. We are in our One City, One Book. We're getting there, everyone. I'm excited. And we are in a tour of December events. I'm Anissa. If you don't know me by now, it's nice to meet you. I'm a librarian at the library at San Francisco Public. I usually have a, a document when I do a virtual, so I just put it in the chat and that has library news and then links to our presenters and links as they talk, resources will come up. And so I'll add those, it's like a live running doc. So, I'm just gonna do some library news and then I'll turn it over to our panel tonight, which is the Prison Arts Project, a um, William James Association project. And we've had a couple arts as transformation um, connected to One City, One Book. And you can find all of these on our YouTube channel, including Rodessa Jones, who is like the queen of theatrics and she is the woman behind the Medea project, and that goes into women's prison and brings art and theater as a transformation practice. So this is part of One City, One Book, and if you haven't picked up, this is Ear Hustle. This is the book that we are all reading together. Together we read is the tagline, and it is based on the podcast, also of the same name, Unflinching Stories of Everyday Prison Life. So the amazing thing with this campaign is we get to bring all sorts of other folks in on the topic of this book. And San Francisco Public Library is really um, proud of our jail and reentry services department who serves jails in San Francisco, bringing books to folks inside. And we also answer reference by mail, the most reference by mail this side of the Mississippi from prisons this side of the Mississippi. So a lot of reference, a lot of getting folks books. And then our main library has a lot of re-entry resources that we would love to provide. <clears throat> we would like to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Ramutushaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first people and wish to pay our respects to the elders and ancestors of the Ramitush community. And on that note, I encourage you to find out which land you are on occupying at the moment. There's a great map to do that. And I'm gonna stick it in the chat right now. It's called Native Land. It's very good very interactive and it also shows what treaties were in place, what treaties have been broken, what languages are spoken. Um, also the Segorite Land Trust in Oakland, women-led based organization working in land rights. Left, for the rest of December coming up, we still have some virtual events for Round One City, One Book. Our favorite LGBTQ prisoner resource ABO Comics, they have started their own podcast called Telaway 411. Tomorrow night, same time, same place, come talk to us and some of their participants. On Wednesday, the Anti-Terror Police Project will be coming to talk about how we keep communities safe ourselves. Um, two events in person this weekend. Please come on down to the main library. It's been so nice. I love if it's raining, it's the perfect time to be there. But also it's just lovely to be in the Civic Center on the weekend, particularly Saturday and even more so on Sunday because we have the farmer's market. But on this Sunday, December 11th, we'll be hosting the Ameris amazing, powerful Sarah Cruzon, who wrote a book called I Cry to Dream Again. Sarah spent two plus decades inside and came out and wrote an amazing book. She is a powerhouse and empowering, and she's featured in Ear Hustle episode 13 called Dirty Water. The book is 
mind blowing. Get it now. And please come to the event. Show some support. Come on down. Um, and then the William James Association will be back with our brothers in Penn happening December 12th. And then we final it out with our own library's own Dr. Jeannie Austin, who has written a book about serving library, uh, serving prisons in the library setting. <laughs> but she they will be joined with a few other folks talking about inspiration, knowledge and curiosity while incarcerated. All right, enough talking from me. I am so happy tonight to have the William James Association Prison Arts Project with us today. And they are gonna tell us about the important work, share their art and talk about how bringing arts education into um, incarcerated individuals is important and how it can help and transform. And the PAP is a major program of the William James Association, offering classes at San Quentin, taught by professional artists in hands-on visual performing and literary art, shop, art workshops. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Henry Frank, who is a returning resident, a teaching artist. He is the communications person for the William James. So I know he does a lot of different hats. So Henry, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Anissa. Uh, I'm just gonna... Another, bam. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I'm I'm a uh, kind of uh, sitting in for Carol Newbork. She was supposed to be the moderator, uh, but um, some uh, events happened where she cannot uh, make it tonight. And uh, I know she uh, was excited to be here and wish she could be here, but you know she has uh, a life as well, and she needs to handle some of that stuff that's going on there. So I am honored to uh, that she asked me to uh, help her and and support her by moderating this panel tonight. Uh, a special thank you goes out to the San Francisco Public Library, the One City One Book, uh, uh, for inviting you know us, the San Quentin Prison Arts Project, um, also to Ear Hustle for st storytelling that reaches so many, and now featuring a San Francisco Prison Arts Project artist original piece and brief interview for each episode. Uh, and you can subscribe to Lockdown Newsletter to get all these with the new episode. Uh, the San Quentin Prison Arts Project is, uh, like Anissa said, uh, under the William James Association. Uh, and so a special thanks go out to William James Association and the executive director, Lori Brooks, and then the site coordinator for San Quentin, uh, which is Carol Newborg, uh, for making all this happen and make sure that, you know, it runs smoothly. Uh, and then uh, has been bringing arts into California prison since 1977. And the one who uh, led the way uh, in, was Eloise Smith. And... Uh, her vision was based simply on the value of providing all individuals with the most meaningful art experience possible. In her words, that mysterious life enhancing process we call the arts, a realm in which patient application and vivid imagine, imagination so often produces magic. So, and it's a continued belief uh, through the William James Association that access to the arts help people understand themselves, grow and change, bringing transformed people back to the communities and families that need them. So thank you for that. I'm going to start the slideshow here. Oops, sorry about this. All right. So this is the part, Prison Arts Project from Inside to Outside. Uh, 
The photos are provided by Peter Mertz. Uh, the artwork you'll see is Henry Frank, uh, Isaiah Daniels, uh, Bun, Jimmy Metal, Joe Salazar, and many others that participate within the program. Uh, the art studio, the Arts and Corrections Art Studio, uh, which hosts the Prison Arts Project, was created in 1980. And you can go and see, you know, the, the full spectrum of Peter Mertz's uh, photo documentation at petermertz.com. There are literally thousands of photos, not just of San Quentin, but uh, California prisons up and down, you know, the state and uh, all the different programs that are offered. And he really captures the beauty and the essence of the energy that happens in those classrooms. Uh, this is inside the studio there in San Quentin. Uh, from when I remember, I'm sorry, it's Saturday mornings, and then there was Friday mornings and uh, Friday evening. I mean, just all kinds of programs going on. And you're going to see a lot of the visual arts. However, there's creative writing, and there's origami, and there's uh, music, band, uh, book binding, just a plethora of uh, workshops that you know that are provided there where uh, William James look for these artists and then the artists come to us and we do our best to place them into uh, the prisons to offer their skill sets and to offer what they have to the men and women inside and then we also branched out uh, into juvenile halls and jails and most recently into uh, uh, veterans returning and, and providing art for them as well. Um, there is a lot of uh, individual experience and, and learning about oneself, which, you know, which is called introspection, uh, uh, just through the practice of doing your art, whatever uh, genre it may be, and to have that patience and to sit there with yourself and uh, figure out what needs to come out. And as you see, you know, there's all kinds of different races, all kinds of, and, and personally, as a, I'm a returning citizen, you know, different politics, different uh, religious beliefs, different uh, just ideologies. And after time of sitting in there with the same people uh, doing the same thing as in painting, uh, you know, all that stuff kind of falls to the side and we just become artists, we just become musicians, we just become actors inside there and we support one another. Uh, so sharing creative experience in a community of others on similar paths strengthens us, you know, gives us those social skills that uh, we might be lacking. And like I said, the prison segregation uh, by race, race and ethnicity breaks down in the studio. Uh, and this is Roy. Uh, I used to sit in a uh, block printing class and then the art class with him. And he's recently, well, recently, probably about a year now, he's been released and he's doing great with his granddaughter and uh, repairing relationships and all that stuff. And, and you know, sending art home, you know, helped uh, many of the people inside to reconnect with their families and their communities. And then I know when I was there, uh, they always offered uh, uh, opportunities to donate some of your art to uh local nonprofits for uh, for auction and, and stuff like that. A lot of people come in with this innate skills and then uh, the rest, you know, are taught and uh, students, the people that are already in there uh, often help each other and you know just from what they've learned from what they know and they take the time and they have the patience to teach the next person uh, to not so much duplicate or uh, copy what they're doing but give them a foundation so they can grow from it and create their own uh, artistic identity so people are finding unknown skills and talents uh working and uh from what's inside and then just 
with anything, it's practice, practice, practice. So they just keep building on that skill set and improving them, which helps build self-confidence with self-knowledge and also self-respect and a sense of uh, uh, identity and then also giving back. And look at all these beautiful smiles. It's a it's an oasis in there, you know. Uh, it's like in the desert, and you find that one little spot of water, so you can get you know your hydration back. And this is uh, the hydration for the soul in the middle of that prison desert. So, and the people that come in, I mean, uh, I mean they enjoy what they do from uh, from everything that I've uh, spoke with and seen myself. Uh, they want to be there and, and they want to give what they can. And I say uh, their artistic practice gave them happiness or, uh, you know, a sense of just comfort and maybe peace. And then they just want to pass that along to the next person and it lands. And then, you know, from my experience and, you know, keep track of people that got out, they then try to do the same thing. And it may not be back inside of the walls, but it's in their communities, it's in their family, it's in their group of friends. Uh, and so, I mean, it just keeps giving back. It's a ripple effect and it goes out. And this piece is a, like a, I think a scaled replica of a San Quentin prison and it sits in the William James office right now. Uh, so hopefully it'll be displayed, you know, publicly, uh, but you get to see it in the picture right now. And so as you see through this, you know, a lot of people are, discovering themselves and really acknowledging, you know, uh, their current environment and their current situations and just putting it into this uh, piece of art or putting into their music or putting into their acting uh, because sometimes you can't find the words to do that or uh, might be a little shy to say those words on, you know, the way you might be perceived. And so you just put it into that canvas. And so self-knowledge, artists often allow us to grasp what we cannot yet understand. And so that's what I'm saying. And sometimes you don't know what you're feeling, but your body knows, and then it releases it through that paintbrush, or it releases it through that guitar, or it releases it, you know, through making uh, the costumes that they make for their uh, performances and stuff like that. And also with cultural identity and self-knowledge and community, uh, Jimmy Metal, Sonny uh, Vasquez, Sam Marquez, Joe Salazar, and Lamavitz Kamadiwala. I'm sorry for butchering the name, uh, but I can relate. I know when I was in there, uh, I really connected with my culture. Uh, I'm an indigenous Yurok and Pomo and just really put it into my my artwork with basket designs and stuff. And just like the men here really, you know, connect it with their culture and then put it on these canvases and, and paper. Some real intricate de detail. Understanding oneself often means understanding our culture and community. Art is a strong way to learn about and contribute to and share our culture, uh, not just with ourselves, but with, uh, and not just with our community, but other communities. artistic expression in whatever form 
you know, passes through those walls and passes through those fences and passes through those boundaries and all, all these other things that we construct in our minds. Because the image is powerful to evoke emotion. So we have three uh, panelists uh, with us today. I am one of them, uh, but uh, I'm going to go last. Uh, but just real quickly uh, introduce uh, Bun uh, uh, and Isaiah Daniels and then myself, Henry. I'm going to start off with Bun uh, and I'm going to put up his slides here in a second. Uh, but Bun is formerly incarcerated for uh, 23 years and has been an artist, was chosen as the Yuri... Uh, Kuchiyama Fellow, uh, then Community Advocate for the Immigration Rights at Asian Law uh, Caucus, and now a re-entry coordinator with Asian Prisoner Support Committee. Uh, uh, Bun was born during the Cambodian genocide where more than half of his family uh, was murdered, including his father. Raised in the refugee camp, Bun immigrated to the U.S. at the age of six. At the age of 18, Bun was a father of two sons and was sentenced to 49 years in prison. Uh, Bun art is mostly based on his traumas and culture. Uh, Bun is proud father of a one-year-old son and grandfather to three grandsons. Bun is now in danger of deportation. And I'll hand it over to you and bring up your slides. Thank you, Henry. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Bun. Uh, thank you, Henry, for that introduction. Um, yeah, uh, today I'm going to talk about my, my journey in art. Um, as a young person, um, I've, I've always liked to draw. You know, my imagination was, uh, was just open. Um, but I didn't know that I lived uh, with trauma because of uh, what I went through, what my family went through and how I lived my life. Uh, so when I was younger, I, I didn't know how to express it. Um, in our culture, mental health was crazy. So uh, being, a, being a, a, a boy, becoming a man, you can't speak about you having mental stress you're supposed to be mentally strong and as for me being the oldest uh son the only son i had to be stronger so i um all my traumas were just kept in my mind and i didn't know that it was coming out violently uh and i caused a lot of a lot of a lot of trauma to other people because i was hurting uh so my first slide is uh, a drawing I did um, when I was incarcerated. Um, uh, I spent five years in um, solitary confinement and my grandpa passed away. And I didn't know how to honor him. I didn't know how, how to cry. I didn't know how to feel. I was numb because, you know, being in solitary confinement, it, it, weighs heavily mentally on you. And when I got the news, all I could remember was his teachings. My grandpa was a Buddhist and was very devoted. So this drawing is a drawing about Buddhist life. And I'm always captured to uh, the starvation of Buddha for enlightenment, because that's how I see myself, trying to enlighten myself to understand myself. Um, this was the only way I could pay homage to my grandpa for all the education, all the teaching, all the Buddhist teaching he ever taught me and how to live a life of uh, kindness. And this is where the point after, after 10 years uh, of incarceration, I was changing my life. I was, I was growing as a person mentally. I was growing emotionally. I was growing, but I didn't know how. So I had to step back 
and remember some of the teaching my grandpa taught me. Next slide. Next slide, Henry. This slide, and in, in, uh, the scripts are, are in Cambodian, says the heart will never forget. And there's a lot going on here. Again, I have the starving Buddha there because like the starving Buddha, I was starving to find myself. Uh, I was starving to understand my trauma. I was starving to understand my demons. Um, nobody really knew since, since I came to this country as a young man that I only slept three hours a night because of the nightmares that I had. And compound on that, the violence that I encountered on the streets, my friends dying, uh, me almost dying. And I just didn't, did not know how to talk to another person about it. I didn't know how to express my feelings about it. I didn't know how to ask for help, knowing that I was mentally traumatized, but I put it into my art. When my feeling and emotion came out and my trauma came out in my mind, I couldn't put into words. I knew I could put into pictures. So my collage is, is, is my own feeling of, 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 of what's going on in my heart, in my soul, and also in my mind. And this is one of the, my saving graces while I was transforming, while I was learning about myself. And also it helped me from the stress of the trauma that I had, because once I got it out on paper, it was just like me speaking these words, uh, speaking my emotions, sharing it with somebody, but I shared it on a piece of paper with myself so I could see what I'm feeling. Um, after about um, 15 years incarcerated, I was given the opportunity to be transferred to San Quentin. Next slide. And um, I was introduced to um, the art project. Uh, next slide. Um, when I went there, I didn't like any other institution didn't have a program like this is either paper or pencil. So like the picture Henry was showing you earlier, because I knew everybody that was in, in those pictures. Um, I went in, I did not know how to paint. I did not know how to even mix colors. When I went in, Carol uh, welcomed me, allowed me to come to class. Like Henry said, we had Saturday class, Tuesday class. We had different teacher like Amy Ho was one of uh, my teachers. Um, uh, Carol, Auntie June did origami, you guys saw. These were the things that never even crossed my path as art or I even tried. When I went there, everybody I let everybody know I know how to draw a little bit, but I don't know how to paint. And together, as a class, as artists, folks came together like, here, let me show you how to do a palette. Let me show you how to mix these colors. Um, I was always self-conscious how people saw my art. And then one of the fellas told me, it's not about what people see. It's about what you create. And I took that to heart. Uh, this painting. Um, I did in Carol's class is at, uh, it's called um, um, I forget what it's called I, I named it but this is because I was looking to my own culture about uh, colonization and this is the Hawaiian people having their 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 civilization washed over by colonization of the islands and I was studying that in my class and it came to me when when I felt it um, and Carol allowed me to expand on my work. Uh, next slide. And uh, this one was uh, when I came home and I was asked to do a painting and how I felt when I came home. And I looked at, I looked at myself and I was like, after 23 years, I'm like this little beta fish in, in a dark river swimming around looking for things I could remember, uh, uh, looking for a future. It's just me in there looking. 
and I was able to express this. You know, I'm I'm full. I'm vibrant. My my colors are full. That's how I'm feeling. Like I'm a new person. Uh, you know, I'm shining because I made it home. But I'm in darkness still, trying to look for my path in life. So my whole my whole experience with uh, art was um, without art for me would have been a life of of a lot of trauma pent up. And with, with, with trauma pent up, it comes out as violence. So that's all I knew in my life. But art helped me to understand myself. And William James allowed me to put color into my art so I could see things like color is a feeling to me. I think a lot, a lot, uh, uh, Carol and them always tell me your palettes are so bright. And I, I, I said, that's, that's how I feel. Like, that's the colors I feel deep inside me coming out. And then, but the world out here is so, it's so strange to me that it's darkness because I don't know anything. And then also my art kept me in relationship with my two sons. Uh, they were growing and I didn't know how to speak to them. So I spoke to them with art. I drew art for them. And, and, and they would ask me, what does this mean, dad? And I would tell them, this is how I'm feeling. And through the 23 years of my life, um, I was able to connect with my sons through art, showing them how I feel, what art meant. And then also showing them culture because I, was, I wasn't there to, to help them understand our culture. So through art, I drew cultural art from so they can understand where they came from. Uh, understand where their family came from so art is very important in my life and i think i believe also art has saved my life mentally emotionally and spiritually because without it i wasn't able to get all this trauma that i had inside me i was i would never able to mourn my losses even during covid i had a lot of friends that lost their life in san quentin and art allowed me to mourn them while I was sick also. So um, I don't know how much time I wasted, I'm sorry. But at the end of the day, without art, I don't think my life could have been so colorful. I don't think my soul could have been so bold and big to to shout out what i'm feeling as a man and without uh william james i don't think i would ever had the opportunity to meet other artists and express express our ideas express our creativity and never once did anybody ever told me <laughs> what are you drawing? That art sucks. It was always, wow, this is so new. And then meeting all the other artists in class. And, and these are folks that maybe I would never become friends. All the photos that you saw Henry showed at first, those are all my friends in art. And I got to know them. I got to know their life. I got to know their passion. And that bond alone is priceless to me. And when I see the artwork that, that Henry showed earlier, I remember each and every person starting it with a sketch and building it to a beautiful, a beautiful picture in the canvas. So thank you. And I appreciate y'all listening to my story. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Bun. Wow beautifully said and thank you for sharing your artwork and and I see your journey uh, uh next up is uh Isaiah Daniel uh a KDAC 2 uh, was born into a life of alcoholism violence and abuse uh, he didn't know of a way to ease his pains his hurt and shame he just held his breath which meant he also held his hate and it showed Drinking, drugs, and maladaptive behavior became a way of life for Isaiah. He needed some place to rest, a place to find himself, 
He needed a place so he could breathe and he found that place in prison. Having a program like the Prison Arts Project provided him with a way of facing his trauma through expressing himself through art. Uh, these pieces are professed, resulting in his healing. Uh, real quick, uh, did you want yours on a loop or did you want me to do it by the mouse? Don't forget to unmute Isaiah. Announcement, please. Okay. First of all, while Henry's looking there, I just want to uh, say, Ron, that was a man that was that was powerful. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so my name is Isaiah Daniels, and um, um, it's an honor to be here. First of all, um, I um, I've also sit on the executive, I mean, the um, advisory committee for um, Uncuffed, a subsidiary of um, Ear Hustle. Um, as um, it was said that I'm also a KDAC 2 substance abuse counselor, on um, which all these things came after I got out of prison. I'm, a, I'm also a formerly incarcerated. I did um, 21 inside, 25, 26 years total. Um, I went into prison with a life sentence. I went in violent. I went in not understanding who I was. And um, it took programs like um, PAP, um, Arts and Correction, William James Foundation. It, it took those programs to help me to sort myself out. Um, you can click this next picture, please. Um, and, the, and the thing, I'm going to take you back and forth for a minute. I'm going to skip up. I also teach at Laney College twice a year, usually in the spring and in the, um, the um, fall quarters. And on the first two pictures, Tanner, can you go back for me? On the first pictures, sorry about that. Um, it was a this was a teaching lesson, um, and what happened was, uh, I went through a lot of abuse as a child, and and I mean I was beaten to the point where I left home at thirteen. Um, I was always told, just like Bun said, you know, that men don't cry, and so I was denied the opportunity of holding of expressing my emotions. Um, and so, as I stated earlier, what I decided to do was take a deep breath and just hold my breath. Um, before every beating, I would hold my breath. Before every abuse, I would hold my breath. Um, every scolding, hold my breath. And until I started turning to drugs and alcohol and Every relationship I've ever been into, I destroyed. Every um, family I joined, I destroyed. Um, every job I had, I lost. Every friend I had, I abused or lost because I was what I was treated, how I was treated. Um, you know, this here went on in my life. And as you see in the picture of these first two pictures, what this was about was, it was a teaching um, process I use at Laney College. The painting of the girl here, the painting is called Pain. And I always said that this painting was me and this was how I felt inside. Um, this painting was painted um, approximately 13 years before my mother passed away. That was one of my monsters. Her mother was the other monster. But in my class when I was teaching, I, the students would always ask me, um, so you, you don't love your mother? I told him, no, I don't love her. I, if she died today, I wouldn't know how I felt about it. And this here painting, and then one day I painted this painting and I said that it's pain and this is how I feel inside. And then the day that my mother died, Henry, go up one picture to me. And this is the, I, for some reason, I just took my, my phone and took a picture of myself. And if you look at my eyes, my face, and look at the picture of this or other painting of pain, um, you can see that it's identical almost. From the, from the nose up, it's almost identical. The only thing is her mouth was open, my mouth was closed. But the eyes, the eyebrows, they're all the same. The nose, the bridge, all the same. I'm just and gonna so jump in really quick. Um, Henry, can you put it in present mode so we can see the photos better? Thank you. 
Yeah, and so um, what it wind up is that all this time, I actually really knew how I felt. You know, I just didn't know how to express it. But I did wind up expressing that on that one painting. I just didn't know I did it until I started, um, until I learned how to express myself. And I learned how to do it through art. I was transferred to San Quentin State Prison um, in 2011. Um, after already spending decades, a decade and a half, just roaming the prison systems of California. Um, like I said it before, I was violent. I fought a lot, um, stayed in trouble, just like my normal life. But when I got to San Quentin, um, go to the next click, please. When I got to San Quentin, I um, um, this picture is called Contemplation. And when I got to San Quentin, I, I ran across the art program. And someone just had invited me to come in. And when I went in there, I seen black guys, white guys, Asians, um, Hispanics. They're all sitting around this here table together talking and, and, and enjoying the day. Um, but where I came from, it wasn't like this. You couldn't do this. And so I found myself a corner and I just kind of sat there and watched everybody else. And fortunately for me, Carol Newberg, the director, um, she used to walk over and slide me a piece of paper and a pencil. And I used to slide it right back over there at her because I wasn't here for this. I was here because I had gotten upset outside. And so I came to get away. I needed a pace to breathe. And this was probably one of the only places you can really actually just get away from the, the prison world out there. Long, long and behold, I started drawing and I started painting. I, I drew years ago um, when I was little, um, but I kind of let it go because of, uh, I didn't have time for drawing. I didn't have um, time for, nothing I did ever came out good. So I didn't figure anything I would draw or anything I have drawn would come out good either. Um, next picture, Henry. And um, so, and this piece here is a piece of stipple, of stipple, um, pointism, however it be like. Um, and it took me uh, months to do this picture, but I, I had the time because most of the time we were on lockdown anyhow. Um, and this picture here is just called Girl. And, you know, if while you're sitting in front of your screens, if you move to the right, move to the left, you'll notice the eyes will always stay on you because I watched everybody. I watched everything around me because that's how I felt still. I was, I, it wasn't that I was scared to be in prison. I was just scared to be in the world. Um, my world was not a pretty one. The next one, Henry, please. Um, and this picture here was another one. I, I, my great grandmother was the only person who ever tried to protect me. Um, she was. It's also stipple or pointism. She was um, one of the last people released as a slave down in Cushada, Louisiana. And um, when I did this piece. Um, I haven't seen her in, in years until I seen a picture of her in her coffin. And this was her, you know, I remember her sitting in, in a shotgun house and um, always trying to encourage me. Um, when they knew they was gonna beat on me, I used to run and hide behind her skirt and she used to hide me. <laughs> Next picture, Henry. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, learning to, to, to use art in an expressive way, it has been very helpful for me. Um, it changed my life, it saved my life. And I, I'm sure as we, as we continue in our lives, we're gonna hear that more and more, how art has changed lives. Um, this painting here, if you happen to went to the um, San Francisco Opera, Fidelio. Um, they used this painting here on the, on the pamphlets. 
um, on TV um, advertisements, um, on everything, this painting was used um, as a reference to Fidelio Art Show. And it was, and it was basically me just standing in, in, in the prison, just looking down towards the, the lit end of the tier. And San Quentin, and um, which I think it was Soledad or Old Folsom, um, I meant to say, um, each tier, as you see, is, is just racks of, of men locked in cages. Um, going up five tiers and, until they just almost disappear into the darkness up there, the darkness and the smoke. On your right hand side, um, those were the catwalks where the guards would walk and with their with their guns and watching you and and if something should go bad that day, they'll shoot you from there also. Um, but this was me just standing there. Next picture, please. Um, this picture here. Um, it was again, see, I'm finding myself, as you see, I'm moving forward. Um, and I'm finding myself. This picture here was called The Journey of a Black Man. And this is how I felt about myself. You know, um, um, as, as we all know, water has always depicted life. And it shows us coming from um, the motherland of Africa. And if you look through that little doorway, you see a ship sitting out there. Um, you know, uh, back when they were taking slaves out of Africa, the ships couldn't get close to the shore because of shallow water. So they bore a doorway through a cliff where the water was deep. And they called it the doorway of no return because the slaves, the Africans used to see them take their people away through that door and never see them return you know, not knowing they were being taken to another country and used the way they were. But as you see in this repainting, um, it leads to over time, the birth of a new black man, as you see the pregnant woman, whose only road was a road to incarceration, such as mine. You can go to the next uh, movie. Um, this is one of the few paintings that, um, or pieces I did, because um, I was looking for myself and as you know, in prison, um, it's a good place to, to find yourself, you know? And, and, and so I was looking at my culture, who was I? Cause I had no idea who I was, um, had no idea at all. I mean, because of the names that I was called, um, they, that couldn't have been me. It couldn't have been me. Next, next picture, please. Um, this picture is called Faith. And sooner or later, I learned that I had to believe in something. Um, I knew I couldn't believe. I know life couldn't be what I went through. And so I had to have faith in something that I was, I was going to do better. And how was I going to do better? And I just kept painting. You know, um, the oceans have rough water has always depicted you know turmoil and and my thing was just to keep my eyes on the prize just keep walking the way I was because I felt myself changing inside um, I felt myself becoming um, something that I'd never been before I felt myself starting to love myself um, through my art next picture Henry. um this is this for me was, some people say it looked like Tahoe. I don't know, never been to Tahoe. But um, this is what I always wanted in my life. This painting was a, was, was what I feel inside of, of how I want it to be or how I want to live, how I want to um, find myself. Um, if you look way down in, if you can see on your, on your screens, there's a cabin down there and sitting on a beautiful lake. And, and, and I realized that I felt like I needed to have peace. Um, I was finding that peace. Um, them pine leaves were done by hand, every one of them. And um, 
I was finding peace sitting there in San Quentin in the art class. I don't know if um, the administrations and prison authorities, senators, um, whoever making these decisions know how important it is um, for men, women, people to have some, a way of expressing themselves. And I couldn't find anything more beautiful to express myself than art. Next one, Henry. You know, um, I think when I painted this painting here, we was going through a tuberculosis, I mean, a T, T, yeah, uh, tuberculosis outbreak. And um, I think it was Solano, Solano um, State Prison. And um, I was, I was starting to feel love again. Um, I've never really been in a relationship. I've never been in a relationship sober, you know, and it was, <laughs> it was amazing. You know, you're, you're almost 40 something years old and you've never been in a sober relationship. Um, and so I had met someone and, and I drew this painting. All right, next painting. Um, she was a Hispanic woman. And I always said in this here painting that she danced her way into my life. Um, and um, this is um, what I painted as far as representing her and what she brought to my life. Next painting, please. But ultimately my life was, this picture is called agony. Prior to coming to San Quentin, this is how I felt. Um, as you see, I threw some Van Gogh in there. <laughs> Hope we didn't mind. But um, I, I was struggling. I've been going to the board, um, constantly going to the board and constantly being um, denied. And, and if you see the guy climbing out the manhole back there, that's how I felt, like I was trying to get out of a manhole. And, and my and days and nights were just rolling by me. And the time I got was distorted with a broken justice system, you know, and I've, I've always blamed other people for holding me down until I really realized the only hand that was holding me down was a hand that looked just like me because it was my hand. I held me down with my maladaptive behaviors, with my drug addictions, with, my, um, with the trauma that I never addressed. I held me down, but I've always blamed other people for everything until I finally start realizing I had to start and take a look at myself. Okay, uh, next painting, please. So this is a journey and, and this is my life. You see all the exciting things behind me, there's nothing. And then there, you could, couldn't see anything ahead of me. You know, and, and most times when you hear people they always say, you always draw an elephant with his trunk up because of his pride, because of his, um, his spirit. Well, I did mine with the trunk down because I didn't have any pride and uh, my spirits were low. Um, next painting, please. And this is what I wanted. Um, I call it golden pond. I guess you can imagine where it came from, but this is what I wanted. I, I just wanted to be free. I just needed to be out of prison. I wanted, um, you know, and this is after I had started William James, uh, I mean, started working in the arts program in uh, San Quentin. Um, that shell that I lived in, it started cracking. And I, I start longing to be free. I, I look at some of the guys on the prison yard that um, I've been knowing for decades now. And they're walking the same way, same talk, uh, same talk that I was walking, but I, I had to change something. This is not what I wanted to end my life at in prison with a life sentence. Um, I needed to be free. Um, okay, Henry. And so I sat back uh, 
and I watch. This is also one of the paintings that in my earlier days, um, still trying to find myself, um, associated myself as a panther. Um, beautiful, but deadly. Not that I'm beautiful, <laughs> but you know where I'm at. Um, but beautiful, but deadly. And I, I seen myself that way as I, I try to I tried to tell myself I was a good person, no matter how bad I was. Um, ultimately, it did not work out. Okay, next painting, please. And this is one that um, I, I have yet to understand why I painted this painting outside the fact that my mother was a Leo. It was her painting. Um, when she died, her husband sent it back to me to make it part of um, my gallery. Next painting, please. Um, this painting here is called Pretty Lady. Um, this is when I kind of first started back painting. Um, I needed some beauty in my life. And I, um, this is Shoshana Lathan, who also looks like Dorothy Dandridge, Dandridge. If from those of you who are old as I am, you know who she was, a great actress. Um, and so I, I, I painted this piece here. Um, I, I needed, again, I'm trying to find the beauty in things and because I couldn't find it in me. So I searched outside of myself. Next painting, please. This was just a portrait I did for a guy. Go to the next painting. This painting here, um, it was from an Indian brother. I had painted for him. And this painting was supposed to be given to him. He was um, from the, I think, Henry, help me if I do wrong here. I'm from the Northern area of California who, um, who worship bear and the brown tail hawk, I think it was, spotted hawk. Mm -hmm. And thank you. And um, so he asked me to do this here dream capture for him. And I did. And the day I finished it, I was walking out to the yard to give it to him. And I was no more than probably 20 feet from him when he was rushed and stabbed. And um, that's the last time I seen him. I never got a chance to give the painting to him. I um, didn't know who his family was. So this painting here means a lot to me because, you know, um, fortunately for me through art, I, I'm still alive and I just wish I could have gave it to him. Maybe it would have brought some change into his life. Next painting, please. Am I at the bottom, Henry? I believe so, that's the last okay. one. All right, great. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is that, you know, um, being able to go to the, into an art class um, where people got along and like Bun was saying, uh, very well said too, that you can go in there and you felt so comfortable sitting down, just talking and painting and drawing with the people that are in there with you. Um, from the day I um, exited prison, it was either, William James, uh, Peter Merckx, um, there was someone, uh, Lori Brooks, Carol Newbert, um, Henry himself, there was someone always there um, promoting me to continue painting, continue painting, continue painting. And I did. And by so, I, like I said, I teach at Laney College. Um, I use it in my counseling as art therapy. Um, I still use it on me and myself. Um, even today, when I find myself becoming depressed or upset about something, I take a brush and I, I just paint away a cloudy day and paint sunshine back into my life. So I just hope that by us doing this tonight that it gets out there that uh, art is a means of transformation. Art is a doorway to the unknown. 
I mean, I just, I can only imagine what I would have been or what I could have done if I knew I could have expressed art myself through art. I too was told that boys don't cry. I was, I was denied the opportunity as a child to express myself. And so I guess now I have the opportunity to, through art, to express myself. And I want to thank every, each and every one of you out there. I'm, my time, I know it's good. Um, I want to express everyone out there. Thank you for opening these doors. And I hope we get this message out to all the right people um, to let them know that we need these programs in the prison system. Oh, thank you, Isaiah. Wow. Another powerful presentation and sharing of, uh, of your journey. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, the last uh, uh, panelist is Henry Frank, uh, which is me. Uh, uh, Henry Frank is a descendant of the great nations of the Yurok and Pomo tribes. Uh, he is a returning resident, prison arts project alumni slash clerk, currently working with the William James Association as the communications administrator and prison arts uh, project teaching artist. Uh, he uses his art to amplify the voices of people of color, specifically Native Americans, uh, people who are currently experiencing incarceration and returning residents, also known as formerly incarcerated, to expose the mistreatment, the dehumanization, and desolation. These people have voices. His contribution is to make sure their voices are heard beyond the reservations and the prison walls. Art personally has freed and expanded his scope of humanity and himself. And it has been a tool for introspection, connection, and expression. All righty. All right. Well, thank you uh, for having us all, and thank you for. Uh, having me here for the for the invite, um, it, it's a uh, very uh, close to me. Um, uh, talking about, uh, I guess the the uh, the activism and the support of uh, the arts inside of correctional facilities, maybe state, city, uh, juvenile hall, or, or you know uh, other places that that are underserved. Uh, and I'm just going to go on kind of chronological order with my uh, thing. Uh, this is Stairway to the Spirits in 1999. So I've been incarcerated like five years. Um, I was just doing little things at first. And then they uh, got this, like this, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, like 12 by 16 art pad. It wasn't the best of quality, but they had these uh, colored pencils that came with it. And then I was able to get the pens through uh, quarterly packages and stuff. And um, uh, as a child, I mean, I knew I was native, I was Yurakapomo, and I knew of our dances and our ceremonies and all that stuff, but we didn't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, and I wasn't introduced to the sweat lodge until I was in San Quentin uh, when my, uh, uh, I guess, uh, my current spiritual journey, I mean, it's all of it, but my most uh, uh, recent, I say, and, and that's like, you know, almost 30 years ago, but uh, it just came out through my art uh, using the basket industry. And then some of the animals that I believe or that I know were my spirit guys to get me to the next level. Uh, 2007 in San Quentin, uh, at this point, up to this point right here, I, I accepted to die in prison. I had a 29 year to life sentence and, uh, and, you know, I didn't see anybody going home no matter how many degrees they had, PhD, no matter what programs they had, no matter what they did, nobody was going home. So I was like, well, this is it. This, this is my life. Uh, and then uh, I met a brother named Arliss. He's my elder. And uh, I can't get into all of it. Don't have enough time. But there was a point where uh, we were walking out and in San Quentin, you could see the 101 and you could see, uh, I think it's Larkspur and all this stuff, all this life that's going on out there. And I never looked out there. And then uh, one day he looked at me and he's like, you're a stupid ass person. 
And I was like, what? He's like, if you can't see yourself outside of those walls, you'll never be outside of those walls. And that was the beginning of my journey of uh, getting outside of those walls. And uh, I believe that was like 2005, 2006. And so at this point, I started going to self-help groups and I started, you know, getting, I mean, I got to arts and corrections first thing and I had that, but uh, this piece here represented that I'm no longer you know, dying or no longer rotting in prison. I'm actually just in hibernation until this winter storm passes. And then here's 2008, got salmon. Uh, and it's just, you know, when the Klamath, uh, you know, with the spawning and, and the salmon and then the bear really connecting with my bear medicine and my bear, you know, spirit and uh, just, you know, manifest it. And then in 2012, uh, actually, that's not right, I don't think. I think that was uh, 2010, actually. Sorry about that. But I got to SADF. They moved me out of San Quentin, not voluntarily, and they put me down in the uh, substance abuse treatment facility in Corcoran. And uh, the MAC committee, which were the liaison between the population and the administration, uh, there happened to be a food strike and a work strike uh, within that population. And so they came in, you know, we were the head of the snake. So they cut the head of the snake off and threw us all in the hole. And I'm sitting in the hole and uh, which is like a jail with inside the prison, if you don't know. Uh, and, and it's waiting to be, you know, to go to your hearing. And so I'm sitting there and I'm just like, Wow you know, how did I get to this point with all of the, after all of the programming, after the arts and corrections, after, you know, men, uh, uh, inmates putting away childish things and, and all these other programs that were helping me. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, do I resort back to my level four mentality? I know how to, you know, survive in, in this environment with that ideology and, um, or do I implement, you know, all of the new tools that I was given in San Quentin and, you know, conflict resolution, really looking into myself, what, what feelings am I having, you know, what needs are not being met and just understanding for myself that, you know, I was scared and I was confused and I was angry and all of these things. And I was just laying on the bunk and uh, truth be told, I had some tears coming down my face because I didn't know what to do. Do I tell on everybody who was part of it? Do I uh, just roll with it? Do I just keep up what I've been doing? And I was just really, my honest thought was, man, I wish I was back in that arts and correction studio right now, just painting. And I was just like, man, I wish I had a canvas. And I rolled my head over. And then I saw this bag and it was a bag that they put your, your, you get your roll of toilet paper without the cardboard thing in it. And you get some tooth powder, you get two envelope, a couple pieces of paper, and then like a pen filler that cut down to like an inch and a half without the outside of it. And so uh, I just tore off the gluey part of the envelope, rolled it around the pen. And I took apart the bag and I just start from one corner, the upper left hand corner, and I just drew all the way across to the lower right hand corner. And by the end of it, I was calm. I had a clear head to think about like, what is the best strategy to, you know, uh, get back to the main line. And, uh, and, it's, and at the time, I was just putting all of that uncertainty into this paper. And then years later, when I get to see it, and there's a beautiful story behind it, but I'm not going to share it today. But I mean, it's just a really just a great connect connection piece. But today I get to see the the battle within me that was going on. Do I continue, you know, my self-help programming, my uh, self-improvement, or do I go back to what I knew, you know, and that's the dark spot. But even in the dark spots, if you look at it, there's butterflies and dragonflies, there's still that piece that wants to be there. Um, but it helped me get through that. And in 2013, um, I was uh, finally released, and this is the first uh, block print that I got to do. Uh, and it was probably like literally maybe a month or two months after my release. And um, this one is called Finally Home. And most recently, I've been... Uh, dealing so a little background when I was in in there I rarely rarely did anything that represented prison or represented 
um, in my mind, you know, uh, the trauma of it and the hardships of it and the, uh, oh, what's the heinousness of it and the callousness of it and the disconnection of it and just really put my, my uh, energies into uh, Native American, like my, my spirit guides that, you know, that are not caves, they can fly wherever they want, go wherever they want and connect it with that. And then just connect with my past and my ancestors. And so, uh, recently I've been able, I'm at a spot where I can really look back and reflect on, uh, you know, just the hardships and, 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 the torment of, of prison. And, uh, I just happened to put it into Lego sculptures, uh, this is the Mind Prison series. Uh, this is series one. And this one is uh, the Minefield. Uh, and it's just uh, the middle one and the and the first one from the left. And then the visiting room. And the visiting room was almost like the arts and corrections where it was a neutral area where there was smiles and there was family and, you know, just people getting along. And then uh, from that came the gun towers, and then also the uh, the transportation bus. And um, just quickly going through here, and just uh, you know, get a full kind of view of the prison. And then here's the visiting room, all of it uh, of custom made uh, at, to the decals and stuff. And then getting into my spirituality again uh, for the people with the bear dancer over uh, sweat lodge and then easy come easy go getting into you know really seeing that burst of color on these really single colored uh, prison walls and prison wall uh, uh, fences and stuff like that and paul marks the spot and that's the dance arbor that i first uh, bear danced in and then getting into really the trauma of what I've experienced and what I've seen uh, with get down uh, headshot. Uh, actually, it's no warning shots, but uh, the title. And then finally, this one here, I was just hurting so much, maybe like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it was like false heart attacks. And I just like, I just want to put it in this camp. I want to capture it on it. I want to trap it in this canvas. And this is the piece that came out. Desperation meets helplessness. And uh, this is deep in prayer. This one just came to me and, and it just, I mean, it's just a beautiful piece. Sorry for going so quickly, uh, but I just want to be mindful of the time and everybody's, you know, time as well. Uh, and so if there's uh, any questions, I'm sure we can about another 10 minutes or so. Hi, I'm going to come on and there is a lot of questions in the chat or like a lot of a lot of comments slash questions. So I'm going to try to dig through some of them. Um, there was one that was just came through. Um, what are, what is the classroom setting like? And um, so do they teach you techniques? Do you talk about themes? What is that like? Uh, it depends. I'll, I'll speak first. Sorry. Uh, it just depends on, you know, what the classes, there's portrait classes, there's open studio, uh, there's, uh, you know, landscaping and stuff like that. I know when I first got in, uh, there was, uh, Patrick Maloney, may he rest in peace, but he did a color theory class and he actually got a chrono for it saying, you know, that you completed all his, uh, uh steps that you needed to. Um, and then there was blending, uh, I think with, uh, Beth Phelan when we were doing the book towers and, and book covers and just blending a bunch of those stuff together and so um uh, but if you're in the open studio you know you just kind of do what you're doing and then everybody kind of like just peer teaches one another and which which did you all like the best did you draw to one more to the other uh for me i really uh connect it with block printing uh, and that was uh, Katia McCulloch's class in uh, San Quentin. Just it was just great vegging out on, uh, you know, sketching out your piece and then making all the cuts in it. Where you just it's a it's a meditative state, just like painting. But this one it was just new to me, and it was just 
I just really got into it. Fun. Yeah, I I enjoyed all, I enjoyed all the class because I was just learning so much. Uh, I before uh the art class, I was just paper, pen, and pencil, so everything was new to me, and I was just learning everything I can. I have a lot of pieces that are in stipple. I love ink. I love doing um, a lot of pieces with ink. And so um, I think if, if I had a choice, it just takes so long. But I love the um, stipple work. I love the coloring in your work too, Isaiah. It's so muted down and but like powerful at the same time. Um, a, a couple people mentioned, um, you know, you all mentioned, and then they all mentioned that how trauma really comes up when you're you're making your art and how it helped you all work through that. And so did you start learning about like the impacts of your trauma while you were doing art? Or was that like a separate class that you took? Or how did you realize that that trauma was there and that art could really help unpack that? Okay, I'll go first on this one. All right, so for me, um, I, um, a, a, a Senate bill came through the prison system to train um, inmates to become counselors, or there was one day get out of prison, then come back in a mentorship. I went through that program. And so by being a parallel process, me studying, but using I affirmations so I can talk about myself, is when I start learning that I am traumatized. I, I do have problems not problems, I have issues, you know, and so, um, and then I realized, and when I find, start finding out what they was, I started using art as a means of, like, when I feel myself starting to over, overload, I go draw, I'll do stipple, I'll, I'll sketch, because most of the time I was locked in the cell because of the kind of prisons I was in, but no, it took art um, for me to free myself, to free myself mentally. Yeah, um, art just came natural to me for expressing my emotion because I didn't know how. And it was so much in my head, in my heart, in my soul that it had to get out somehow. And um, it came really natural to me to, I even, when I didn't even know it, I just felt good when I got it out on paper. I felt relief. I I felt weight off my shoulders. So it came natural to me like that without me even knowing. Thank you. So there's there's a lot of love in the, the audience coming through. I hope you're all reading those in the chat. Um, and I did, there was a question earlier. It was kind of quick going through all of the art. So this is available on our YouTube, so you can watch it again. And I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Everything is in this one doc you can find. Um, and I'll just read a couple a couple of the amazing comments I see is the three of you have created such powerful work from deep, deep difficult, and authentic inner growth. Um, thank you for sharing such powerful and, and expressive work. And Again, you can find the website to the William James Association. If you scroll all the way down, you will see a donation button that you can help help prolong and make this project live forever. Well, hopefully not forever. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if it was not happening forever? There was no need for you know a prison arts program. That's a streamland, but. All right, so any final questions from our audience or would anybody like to say anything from the crowd? Because I do see Carol's out there. I see um, Lori Brooks is in the audience. So is Zoe, so is Carol, and so is Peter Mertz. So if anyone else wants to say anything, you're welcome to, to I can make that happen. Carol, I'm gonna, gonna give you the mic. And I also saw Zoe and Ned, too, just to give them a shout out. Oh. And we can hear you. 
Sonia's out there too. I saw. Oh, good. And Laura. Yeah. So um, I just want to say that I hearing each of you tell your stories and see your work, and I know you and I've seen your work, but this just what came together in such a beautiful, moving way. It's a valuable, valuable thing to have documented. I'm really glad that it's recorded in this. So thank you. And I thank you all for being all able to share like this it's it's such a role model really for a lot of people it's like you were saying you know you see artists like we come inside and we're moved and um you know see amazing people and amazing things happen and then you take that you know we're so grateful for all that coming in and and sharing with you and getting to witness and then you go out and share it further it's just thank you thank you this is wonderful thank you carol all right final words please please close us all out any final words from the three of you you want me to call on you bun you go first <laughs> uh like i wrote on on the um the chat uh thank you to all my instructors um you you became friends to me in there through art um taught me a lot um showed me that um art could be a bridge between uh, uh folks that are incarcerated and the community and you help us spread our image spread our creativity just spread what we, uh, our deepest feelings. And yeah, without, without art, I think my life would have been different. Um, I think my healing process would have been different and harder. And I think that uh, through art, I've, I've made a family outside of my family because I'm still, are connected with the artists that uh, I sat next to. Uh, when Henry showed the photos, it bring, it bring back a lot of memory of the class that I was in and a lot of folks that I was with. And I still call them my brothers. So thank you. Isaiah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna say this to um, the people in Uncuffed, um, some of the guys that I'm, and, um, your hustle, Carol, you know you, Steve Emmerich, Lori, even Henry, Bond. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I, and it's, it's a shame when you have to go to prison to find people and that you love and care about. And that's what I did. I, I don't think I've ever told anyone that I really loved them or cared about them. But when I got out of prison, I just felt like the William James Association just wrapped their arms around me and, and held me and, and they stayed with me from the day I walked, they're still with me. Um, I hear from them all the time, I stay close to them. I never realized while sitting in prison that these would become friends of mine, family, like Bon said, families of mine. And um, I just want to let them know that thank you for everything. Um, you've done so much for me and I appreciate you, all of you. I think I read your lips that I'm, I'm next. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get to my mic. Yes, Henry, you got him. <laughs> uh, again, just, uh, I mean, just a heartfelt uh, a thank you, deep appreciation and gratefulness to the San Francisco Public Life, uh, Library and to Anisia for uh, hosting us and, and, and giving us the space for Kel Newborg for uh, coordinating it with you, uh, to Ear Hustle, to the William James Association, and just to let people know, you know, uh, we're not the only uh, organization out there for the arts and corrections or many other 
leaders out there up and down the state in a lot of these prisons. So appreciation to all of the teachers who have dedicated, you know, the the time that they they give to the men and women inside experience incarceration and really just a deep gratitude because it just goes beyond just the instruction. It goes beyond the materials, you know, it goes beyond uh, just, you know, technique. You know, they're creating a space and displaying uh, kindness and equity and equality and professionalism, you know, and what a normal citizen is and, you know, having that professional boundary friendship slash instructor and then just you know a shout out to the california uh, uh i think a lawyer for the arts the california arts uh uh shoot cac uh <laughs> council uh to tpw to jac you know all of these uh organizations that support our organizations as well to make this happen and cdcr you know for you know making those connections with the cac and and all these other groups to get down to us and have a working relationship and try to make the carceral environment a little bit better so just and thank you for all the people that took the time to to, sh to come in and listen to us and hear some new ideas and hear some life stories and hopefully, uh, you know, make it more uh, humanized uh, for the people who are wearing these, uh, you know, color coded clothing uh, that depicts them as, you know, incarcer incarcerated. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Bon. Thank you, Isaiah. Carol. The Prison Arts Program, William James, we appreciate you for sharing your story and definitely art transforms and super powerful. Library community, I'll see you here.